Through this course, we've learned a lot about how the material and the, chain and the energy changes as a chemical reaction occurs. We've even learned about how reactions can reach a certain stable point of an equilibrium. In this module, we're going to talk about how fast reactions happen. Our learning goals for this video are to define what the rate of a reaction actually is, and then set up some differential rate laws that will govern how fast that occurs. So let's first take a look at reaction evolution. I want to consider a very simple reaction, one in which N2O4 goes to form, breaks apart basically, and forms two NO2 molecules. So if we were to draw a picture of how these concentrations change as a function of time, it may look something like this. Now we saw a picture similar to this back in module four when we were interested in characterizing equilibrium. And you can see that the flat area at the right side of the curve is marked as the equilibrium region. This time we're going to be more concerned with how fast things occur and what can we learn about the speed of this reaction from looking at a curve like this. Now let's review sort of what this curve is telling us. First of all, we can see that the blue curve, N204, is constantly decreasing in concentration as time progresses. By contrast, NO2, which is the product of this reaction, is constantly increasing. There's no oscillation going back and forth. They're constantly moving in one direction, decreasing or increasing. Uh, in some sense, we can measure the rate as uh, how fast it changes as a function of time, and the rate is clearly the fastest at the very beginning of the reaction. And clearly, once we get out to the equilibrium region, the rate basically isn't occurring at all. It's totally flat. So we would say the rate is zero when a reaction has reached equilibri equilibrium. Now we pointed out in module four that these curves also tell us something about the stoichiometric ratio. And in particular, since one N2O4 molecule results in two NO2 molecules, we should see gaps between their initial and, and equilibrium concentrations that reflect those stoichiometric ratios. What I want to focus on, though, is this part of the curve here, because this is where the reaction is actually changing and, uh, and occurring, and it's where we can get some information about how fast it may be occurring. So I'm going to pick a particular time along here, because that would be a, a vertical uh, line through this diagram, and look at the slope of both of these as they change in time. Now you'll notice that as I drew this out, the slope for the top one is minus m. It's a negative slope because it's decreasing. And the bottom slope I've drawn as positive 2m because it's increasing. But it's important that those two are related to one another, and they're related by the stoichiometric ratio. So N2O4 is going away, but each time one of its molecules is destroyed, two of the NO2 molecules are created, so the NO2 molecules are growing in twice as fast. All right, so how might we measure the speed of a reaction? Well, in general, we measure speed as distance covered per unit time, so it's something like meters per second. And if we make an analogy to races, you know, one way we measure speed is the first runner to cross the finish line in a race. Okay, but we might also think about characterizing the fastest runner as the one that reaches the maximum velocity, or you know, the top velocity during the course of the race. So if, if we were look at the tortoise and the hare, and the tortoise won the race because it was the first to cross the finish line, but I think most people would agree the rabbit was the faster runner. So depending on how you want to define speed, you might choose one or the other as the actual fastest one. Now in a reaction, we have a reactant, and I'm going to make it simple, a reactant that just goes to products. Um, so we might uh, define an instantaneous rate as the rate of change with respect to time of the concentration of that reactant. So that sort of harkens back to the picture that we drew on the previous slide, where we would now relate the rate to those slopes. But clearly the rate is changing as time goes on. It's This is one instant in time where we've captured the slope. but uh, if we continue to watch this, we would see that the slope changes with time. So in fact, what we really need is a rate law that looks something like this. Now, why did I write the rate law like this? It's, it's the slope of those lines, and in particular, the slope of the disappearance of the reactant. Uh, so that's why I've put the negative sign in front there. And I've written it as proportional to some power of the concentration. Well, we know that the uh, slope changes with time as these uh, reactant as this reaction occurs. And in the case of the reactant, we also know that the, that this slope slows down or it levels out as we lose reactant. 
So this sort of behavior would make sense because as the concentration of the reactant is disappearing, we should see this, the, the rate go down. So in other words, making the rate proportional somehow to a power of this concentration uh, fits in with the behavior that we've seen in the time evolution of the reaction. Let's explore this a little bit farther by uh, looking at these differential rate laws. What we've drawn here is a differential rate law. It's called, uh, it's called that because it, mean, it uh, refers to the instantaneous rate of the reaction, which is, refer which is defined by the change in the concentration over a change in time. Now, I wrote that as being equal to the concentration raised to the power A, uh, raised to the n power, n is actually called the order of the reaction. And there are three orders that we're going to primarily concern ourselves with, 0, 1, and 2, which we would call 0, 1st, and 2nd order reactions. Now the way the rate behaves in each of these cases with respect to the concentration of the reactant is as follows. In a 0th order uh, rate law, the rate doesn't change at all. It doesn't depend upon the concentration of the reactant. It's utterly constant throughout this process. There are such rate laws. In fact, uh, uh, some of these are actually uh, responsible for enzyme um, me mechanics in cell reactions. Um, a more common form of rate law that we see is one where the rate is directly proportional to the concentration. So the, the higher the concentration, the faster the rate. So this is a little backwards in the sense that uh, as, a, as a reactant disappears, we would be moving from high reactant concentrations to low reactants. So we'd be moving from right to left on this particular graph. But this uh, indeed captures the behavior that we saw in the case of N2O4. Another possibility is a second order rate, and again, it, it goes down as the, um, as the concentration uh, is smaller. But uh, in this case, it's not a linear variation. It's a curved variation. It looks like a parabola in this case. Now, I want to uh, spend uh, just a couple of minutes talking about rate constant units and the units that we're going to be using to typify rate. A reaction rate is typically a change in a concentration per unit time. We're looking at how fast does a reactant disappear. It would also be how fast is a product up here, but uh, we're going to focus on the reactants for the most part. So the typical units for this, instead of being meters per second, might be molarity per second. In other words, the concentration is changing with time, so how fast is, how many molarities does it change per second? So let's look at what the units of the constant k that appeared in the rate equation, uh, the rate law, would, uh, would vary depending on the order of the rate law. So for a zeroth order rate law, we would have this rate uh, equation that uh, minus the change in a concentration with time is equal to k times a raised to the zero power, but anything raised to the zero power is one, so that's just equal to k. So that means that k is going to have the same units as rate, which we've decided is molarity per second. In the case of a first order rate law, this would be our differential rate law. It would be the negative of the change in concentration with respect to time. Time equals to k times the concentration. So since the concentration carries with it uh, units of molarity, we've already got the molarity, so the k would have to be in units of one per second, or inverse seconds. For a second order rate law, we'll again see uh, similar changes. In this case, the rate law is equal to negative, uh, is equal to k times the concentration squared. So the concentration squared carries units of molarity squared. So for this to match the overall uh, units of the rate, meter, molarity per second, we would have to have the rate constant have the uh, units of one per molarity per second. All right, so this has been a general introduction. We'll be learning a lot more about these equations in the following uh, lessons.